Hello everyone and welcome to another live conversation. As you could can see right now, we have new studio, new visuals, and basically a couple of guests uh, who are joining me in this conversation we have a very interesting story to tell today. Um, so I have four experts in their respective fields. So we will talk with uh, Oliver, who is an expert in robotics and motion systems. Then we have John Browett from the CLPA organization, who will be our expert in industrial networking. Then Christian Nomine and his expertise, he's bringing his expertise in analytics, data science, artificial intelligence, and so on. And, and last but not least, uh, Daniel, who is an expert in control systems uh, of various types. So, uh, guys, thank you for being here. And uh, what we are going to do today, um, we will make a claim, a strong claim, that the game of manufacturing is changing a lot. And uh, the sources of competitive advantage are shifting from what was in the past, like, you know, making machines faster, more um, performant and so on, to the situation where data becomes king and data-driven insights are, um, let's say, changing completely the way how we perceive manufacturing. Um, so many topics to cover and uh, just giving you one example. Um, uh, the current situation with artificial intelligence. Um, it's a very heavy topic with a lot of noise in the media. Uh, but all in all, we, we will make a claim again that uh, you can start very small with artificial intelligence as well. So uh, you can now use artificial intelligence on the component level, machine level, up to the line, without ever touching cloud technology. Um, so many topics uh, we will have to cover. So it is possible that our conversation will be longer than usual. And that means we might not have time for Q&A session at the end. There are ways to stay uh, in touch with us and interact with us. Uh, we will be asking a couple of questions here during the podcast. Uh, first one might be coming very soon. Uh, then we will give you our email addresses so that maybe we can go through some topics in detail. And there is also a possibility to um, set an appointment in our calendars. So if you have a need to uh, discuss something in uh, greater detail, uh, we really encourage you to um, reach out to us uh, because we strongly believe that we call them game changers. Those technologies can really reshape the way how we do the manufacturing. So if you want to have some details, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, perfect. So I mentioned the artificial intelligence, and uh, I think that this is the topic we will start with. Uh, so Christian, the first question I'd like to ask today is, how would you start small with artificial intelligence? And could you give us some, let's say, proof of concept how this start small and scale up approach can be suitable for something so advanced like artificial intelligence? Well. Manufacturing companies are already looking into how data science and AI can help them on their journey, on their digital journey, to discover the full potential of their shop floors. For instance, companies are really having a big challenge right now, finding expert operators and qualified people. Could human knowledge transferred into an AI-driven solution that supports them into their decision-making process. Companies are trying to find answers on these questions in terms of how machine learning with AI can transfer human work knowledge from experienced operators into a guiding system for younger and less experienced staff. And those kind of advancements are going on already now and companies are starting to realize the potential and that they don't need to build complex and very expensive data science systems to utilize the advantages of the technology. Okay, so your example is actually, well, uh, 
very imaginative, I'd say, because um, normally what we think about when um, discussing AI, that is, um, well, trying to make sense out of machine data, but, but uh, basically using AI for this kind of knowledge transfer or experience transfer sounds very advanced. But again, you're claiming that this can be done in a very small scale, starting whenever the company is ready and move forward uh, when they feel comfortable to do so. Uh, that's uh, interesting. And then I need to ask you, then how would you do that? I mean, uh, let's say that the company wants to start small with AI, uh, disregarding whether this is going to be um, knowledge sharing, experience sharing, or is it going to be, um, for example, making sense of the, of the machine data. So how this is achieved from the practical point of view in your, from your experience? Yeah? Well, I would typically recommend to split it up into four different phases of a data science project. And, and the first phase is for sure about setting the right goals. So we need to really analyze the current situation. We need to understand what we would like to achieve with data science and AI. And we also need to build an interdisciplinary team of different intelligences. Like we want to combine the operator input, we want to combine the engineering input. And also we need a management buy-in for these kind of projects. And once this is all set and ready to go, we can then go into a second phase, which is all about collecting historical data from the process, from a machine that you would like to start with in order to analyze. And then it's a common task between all disciplines to look at, first of all, what kind of data is available. So there might already be a lot of data available, but there might also be some ways of requiring some added information by means of IoT sensors, could be a small PLC that you add to your factory. It could even be that we have a lot of historical data sources already by having a customer database with production data or even a SCADA system which has some historical data. And once we work with the expert, with a process expert, to determine what is the best data set to work with, we can then go into the third step, which is analyzing the data and basically creating a system to create diagnostic rules specifically for the use case that we have selected. And we need to establish a system which is then finally using the data set to create a certain output of that AI. But then the most important point is that we need to confirm whether that output, that prediction output, has a good enough precision to really match the customer expectations. And we need to do that with a lot of test data that we get from, for example, different timestamps, different dates in the process, where we need to confirm the precision of the model. Mm -hmm. And once the customer is happy with that, we can then go finally to phase four, which is to establish an online system and to really use an edge computing layer with the diagnostic method, use the model, feed in online process data against the model, getting some output, and then finally sending this prediction result back into the OT level in order to finally being able to optimize the process. And in this whole process that you mentioned, which is very slim and straightforward, we never once talk about cloud. So this is an embedded AI that can work on the uh, control level or edge computing level, uh, uh, if you will. Uh, but uh, it, the complexity of the whole thing is much reduced due to the fact that we are doing everything with the data from the factory on the factory. So this is very, very interesting. But um, since we are making some claims about starting small, I like to go even smaller. So edge level sounds like uh, already something that can be uh, very slim and uh, agile. 
but uh, my next question will be to Oliver. And how would you um, describe uh, using some sort of an intelligence on the component level? And uh, we would appreciate some examples of that. Yeah? Okay, so we have, for example, the AI technology included in our robot Melfa system. So our robot controller is able to analyze data autonomously. So the parameters can be adjusted automatically. So this gives a big advantage to the operator to use the robots with an easy and fast setup, as the time-consuming teaching can be dramatically reduced. So we can say the robot learns to behave like human. So we as a human also make optimization of processes by learning. And this can happen all without any dedicated external devices. For example, also a PC, a high performance PC for the data analyze is not needed. It is all done in our robot controller. I can give you a typical example for an assembly process. The robot has to fit and insert a pin in a hole. It sounds very easy to do, but for sure it's quite important that the robot is not destroying any workpiece, not destroying the pin, and for sure not cutting the hole. So normally, if you do this, uh, you have to make a very time-sensitive and time-active teaching. So the robot needs to move a lot of times. You need always to check the force. You need to check the speed. And finally, this is taking a lot of time time for the operator. So by the machine learning possibilities inside our robot controller, the robot is learning like a human. So the robot is reducing the force, making the movements automatically, adjusting the parameters for the speed, for the position, and finally gives you the yeah, best performance for the movement, for the tag time. So this takes approximately five minutes for the robot to do. And then he gets a result, which is the optimized tech time, optimized movement. So finally, you can say anyone can do this. So you don't need to be a robot expert to do this. And according to our experience, we found that the setup and tact uh, time can be reduced up to 60%. Mm -hmm. And uh, our audience have seen the video uh, comparing the, uh, what you're saying with yeah. the, like a standard operation. So essentially this um, learning by doing is something what humans also do, right? And we yes. implement this on the robot arm level, yeah, without yes. any uh, so external controllers. So there is no connection to the edge or to the cloud needed. Everything is done inside the robot controller. And what you said, uh, Piotr, it's more or less already down on the component level. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, considering that, um, uh, well, um, there is more and more um, robots, industrial robots on the production lines, uh, clearly this is very important. Uh, but uh, most of the manufacturing sites include also different types of uh, mechanical mechanical solutions, right? So robot arms are like that one. They are very speci uh, doing some very specific tasks, but sometimes you need a very high precision operations, and those are like dedicated machines doing that, mostly solved with uh, motion systems. So could you also, because we are staying on this uh, component level, so could you also tell us how, for example, motion uh, drive systems can actually uh, get some intelligence from this kind of solutions. So there's an example which is helping also the customers, the production and the machines to be uh, on the quite high level of uh, performance. This is the auto-tuning function which we have in our servo system. So this auto-tuning, as I mentioned, can improve the efficiency, the accuracy and yeah, the, the movements in any kind of machines. Typical example for these servo motions are maybe packaging machines. So, but what is the auto-tuning doing? The auto-tuning is more or less 
optimizing the control parameters of the servo controller. And this is done continuously. So the servo system, the servo controller is more or less um, yeah, reacting on changing of conditions. And this is done over all the time. So finally, what I mentioned, the target is to uh, achieve a better performance of the machine. But a second point, which is quite uh, important and where the uh, auto tuning can help, is the flexibility and the reduction of change over times for a machine. If you are thinking you have a machine and it's, for, uh, for example, uh, using different kind of materials, different load or a different operation. So normally it must be adapted, the parameters for servo to have the best performance. But thanks to our auto tuning, this is automatically done all over the time. So the servo system is reacting on changing the uh, conditions. And this is all done without <coughs> any interaction of any operator. So it's automatically, automatically done. So it gives you again an advantage of an effective and a quite flexible machine. One more advantage of the auto tuning is the simple setup. So you don't need to be an, yeah, a servo or a control theory expert to get the machine running with the best performance. It's automatically done by the auto-tuning as it is detecting the mechanics and as I explained the changes of the mechanics of the load. But also on the other side, the auto-tuning can also identify and correct issues, which finally gives you a reduction of downtime or also the reduction of maintenance issues because it will also recognize any wear of mechanical parts, any yeah, changes in the, the mechanical parts, and then adapt to the, um, the yeah, actions are not needed so, so uh, much. So finally, it's reducing the time, uh, maintenance time, it's reducing the downtime and giving more effective uh, yeah, production for the machine, mm -hmm. thanks to this auto-tuning function, which we have as a standard in our servo system integrated. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the game changers that we promoted was exactly specifically the auto-tuning function. But of course, this is not even like a one thing, one solution. This is a set of, uh, a set of uh, solutions implemented in the servo drives that make this possible. But I just want to make one thing uh, very, very clear, so just confirming. Auto-tuning is not something that is done, for example, once at the startup of the machine, but this is something that can be constantly done, which means that the servo system is monitoring the operations of the machine all the time, constantly. It's an adaptive auto-tuning, we call it. So, as you mentioned, it's done all over the time and any, any changes can be automatically recognized. Mm -hmm. And this is done not with any external sensors, not with external uh, devices. It's done by our own motor, by our own system. Perfect. So, um, because in the meantime, many people have joined. Uh, so I will uh, re repeat one more thing uh, that, uh, one more time, that uh, it is possible to get in touch with us a couple of ways through the email that we will display at the end, through the Q&A session here, and also by special a calendar appointment app that you can look up into our calendars and uh, get in touch with any of our experts. Um, and we discussed the rise of the intelligence in the modern um, uh, solutions uh, when it comes to uh, digital manufacturing. Um, and this is clearly a very important trend, but I think that it brings also something that uh, we should discuss next. And that is the point of uh, the fact that the amount of data in factories is growing, right? So to have these smart robots or the servo systems that are able to recognize problems with their sur surroundings, the amount of information that has to be transferred in the factory is rising a lot. So uh, I'd like to discuss this point, how, you, how we are addressing in the modern factories, how we are addressing this point that 
we have much more data than in the past. So John, I'll ask you as an expert in the industrial networking, um, could you share your experience when it comes to managing those volumes of data that we call the next section? Right, <clears throat> so um, there's, there's kind of like two key technologies which are helping us do that. So um, one of them is gigabit bandwidth, where we're seeing a very definite shift now towards using gigabit bandwidth networks in factories. Um, and this is helping to deal with the so-called kind of explosion of data, you could call it. Um, and that, that's basically been driven by Industry 4.0 and so on. The, the other key point is uh, convergence, which has been enabled by time-sensitive networking, which is uh, another key technology, TSN as we call it. And um, convergence is important because it's now allowing us to combine different kinds of uh, network traffic together on a single network architecture. So how in the past you would have had maybe like separate networks for IO, safety, motion and so on. Mm -hmm. We can now combine all these together onto a single architecture. But also now we can take things like standard Ethernet traffic with TCP IP and so on. And we can also um, add that onto the same architecture too. So, so really, this, this is now delivering a number of benefits to uh, machine builders and, and other system builders. And, and so, you know, first of all, this means that there's less engineering required to build the system because um, with a simpler network architecture, it means that it's um, easier to create simpler machine designs. Um, of course, that also means that the cost is reduced. Um, so therefore, the simpler design also means that there's a faster time to market. Um, and then finally, when the, when the machines are up and running, um, maintenance is also simplified. Um, so so those, those are kind of like the initial benefits of, of technologies like TSN. Um, but then it kind of moves on to a, a second stage where um, we can achieve increased transparency. And um, as, as Christian was saying, there's, there's a tremendous amount of data now being generated by these processes and these machines. And um, this data is, in some respects, is kind of like hiding how to optimize the machine. So by having a converged network, it makes it easier to get the data out of the machine and up to uh, systems that may be running AI or whatever to, um, to analyze this data and, and generate actionable insights that can then be fed back into the process and therefore optimize it. And, and so really the, the final result of all this is, uh, is increased productivity. You know, in the end, um, you know, we, we all represent some pretty cool technology here, but in the end, the user doesn't really care so much about what the technology is, that they want to know how it's going to address their business benefits. So in the end, maybe I'm talking about time sensitive networking, but the end user is saying, well, how does it help me bake an extra 1,000 loaves of bread per hour or something. And, and really that's what it's all about in the end. How are we using this to deliver those business benefits? Mm -hmm. And because uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, Ethernet technologies were here for a while and uh, well, Ethernet in the past was also a game changer, mm -hmm. completely changing the way how you structure your networks. But when it comes to the TSN technology, the main game changer in the network protocol itself is the convergence, right? Right, that's it. So yeah. this creates a completely new possibilities. And I'd say uh, that um, the TSN communication is a very important addition to the whole structure of the modern control system, right? And the edge computing um, specifically can benefit from having this um, data to be synchronized over the network with the proper um, order of priorities and so on. Um, so I guess this gives uh, a lot of new possibilities, as you said about uh, um, analyzing the data. So maybe going back to, to Christian just for a second. Uh, so let's say you are now, you have your edge computing system uh, with all this data made available by TSN and then you would like to uh, make a sense of it. So going back a little bit to the artificial intelligence topic uh, on the edge level, uh, how would you then make sense of all that data that is flowing to the network? 
So first of all, I think John gave a great example of the, the vision that the companies already have with, with a TSN network, for example. And for me, the road to realizing smart factories, that is something that the customers have already very clearly understood. But there's one point that is sometimes missing, which are the resources to get there. And that could, for example, and very typically, include a specific budget for a data scientist or an AI specialist. So these people, they are not only hard to find, but also not the cheapest ones. And why not putting the human more into the focus of our activities and use existing stuff to start a data science journey using what we call a dedicated virtual AI data scientist. And that will then support him in his activities. And to give you one example, with the data analytics software MyLab, we are in a simple way able to find abnormalities or in your production data, to find product deviations in terms of quality from your product, and we can pre-inform operators accordingly. And everyone, from my understanding, can become a basic data scientist without having expert skills or even going into a very long and advanced training, because that is exactly what we did. We added our own virtual AI data scientist to our software. And that gives two main customer benefits. It will first of all guide the user through all the previously described four steps of a data science project. And even more, it will provide fast results and a simple implementation with that will finally then result in a very good and very measurable return on investment. Okay, um, but uh, I'd like to understand a little bit better how you achieved that. Because, well, there is so many different um, ways of analyzing data. Uh, that includes even like free of charge, um, tech, uh, well, libraries like maybe in Python and so on. Uh, but I understand that MyLab is different in that regard. And uh, this data scientist function um, acts not like a, a environment for programming, like a high level programming like in Python, but it is, it is done in a different way. So how this is achieved, how is it possible that MyLab can somehow give you hints and give you some ideas of how to analyze the data? Well, I was first of all surprised by myself that, that MyLab is able to do that, but that is mainly caused by having 20 years of experience with data science in various different industries as Mitsubishi Electric and that knowledge went completely into my lab in order to help customers starting their data science journey. Mm -hmm. So um, we could call uh, my lab that it is in kind of like an industry specific type of tool. So it, it's not a general tool for every kind of data, it is specific for industrial Yes. Uh, systems. That's okay. Right, yeah. Good. Um, so I think that we covered quite a lot already. And uh, I was thinking that it makes sense that we go into specific use cases. And the most interesting one for many companies is the maintenance. Uh, because, well, I have a feeling that in many factories, uh, operations are already very efficient. So you are producing uh, huge volumes of, of products and uh, with a very, very good quality. But nevertheless, even in the best type of factories, uh, you will see uh, machines stopping and breaking. So I'd like to move to the maintenance uh, topic as a kind of like a use case of using the intelligence, using the extremes, extreme amounts of data in the production side uh, to understand how this particular task can be improved. So I will and now shift to Daniel. And uh, I'd like to discuss um, technology of machine surveillance for a couple of reasons. Um, we called uh, machine surveillance one of our game changers. 
Um, and this is also an example how you can utilize the convergence in the TSN networks, for example, to get the uh, video data through the network. But let's start from the basics. So what is machine surveillance and why is it our game changer? Yes, uh, thanks, Piotr. So I think in general with the system recorder, we have a really great solution and innovative approach for the topic of maintenance. And starting a little bit about uh, what is maintenance in general. So we have, for example, predictive maintenance that looks at the actual status of the machine. So we are checking whether there is some grease needed or whatever and um, predicting whether the machine is breaking down anytime soon. But no matter how highly optimized your machine is, there are situations where definitely you didn't think of, or there are events that also you didn't plan, and uh, that results in a quality loss, for example, or can also just simply stop the machine, which reduces your OEE, and basically you're losing money every minute. And thinking about maybe you had an event lately and if you thought about what would be the optimal solution for that, um, you want to react really fast, right? So you want to, to be at the machine on time. You would also like to um, see the moment in time when the error happened or for example, when um, the quality loss is dropping. You would also like to have your maintenance team to be on site and uh, or, for example, every, everywhere in the world. You would like to have them access to have uh, a look at the machine as well. But the reality is, uh, in most of the cases, that you feel disconnected from your machine. Um, you arrive at the machine, the error already, already happened, so you cannot go back in time, basically. Um, probably you have some logging file already uh, in place, um, but maybe the, the right data is, is missing that caused the, the problem. So, worst case, basically, you have to reproduce the error. And all of these, these points we are tackling with machine surveillance. Um, so first of all, I would like to say that with the help of TSN, of course, we can combine all the data feed, all the uh, video feed as well. And because we can combine data and video, that gives us the opportunity to also place video cameras into the process. And um, I think I would have never said that, but you can basically travel back in time in a, of course, limited way, let's say like this. But together with TSN, we can synchronize all the, the video feed and the data um, and um, yeah, travel back in time. So we see exactly the event when it happened, we see all the data and we can start analyzing, right? Um, so that all is being enabled by the TSN technology. Um, I would say in general, um, also, in terms of AI, we were talking about many AI solutions. We also have some, um, some video recorder that is uh, driven by AI that helps you identifying exactly in the video feed where in the past time the error happened. So you can directly jump to that uh, situation and start analyzing. That was my, my, my point, actually, because when I, when I think about the machine surveillance, I can imagine you know, constant uh, video uh, recording of the machine and for 99% of the time nothing happens on that machine, but there are errors uh, that are crucial for the performance of the machine. So how the system knows that something wrong happened and mm. how can it identify in the stream of video? Mm. That, is, that is very important, I think. Um. Probably I gave an example, um, everybody knows a dash cam, right? In your car you have the dash cam and if you have a crash or some vibration or somebody wants to steal something out of it, the dash cam is uh, having a trigger. So in terms of the machine, you have, for example, a quality index that's dropping, which could be the trigger, or you could have, for example, just like the machine stop, which is also then the trigger. And you're recording data and video before the trigger constantly 
and also after the event occurred. So you have your data set, your video data basically already in place, so you can start analyzing right away. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so I think I understand. And uh, I, just to make sure, it seems um, the video stream and the code of the machine, so like PLC program and so on, those things are synchronized, so you don't have to search in like mm. those two places in parallel. They, they are synchronized so that you know exactly what happened in the PLC when the error happened. Yes. Okay. And I think also what is very important is that if you think about uh, not only the one machine, but also one line, um, at the end, maybe you have the error, but it was created much, much uh, earlier before in a previous process. So that means you have to go through a very long video, for example, like five or 10 minutes. But with our AI technology that can analyze the video, we directly give you the exact position or uh, back in, in the time. You can just uh, go back and just pick out this data set there. Mm -hmm. You already know the quality drop was exactly this process. So you can start analyzing right away if, and anywhere in the world, basically. Yeah, so it's interesting that I asked you about the machine surveillance and we were back to AI. But uh, clearly that, that is what yeah. uh, reshapes the manufacturing, uh, mm -hmm. as we said. And maybe one, one point that I also want to add is that uh, for the OEM, obviously, this solution gives you a very high OEE, the, the maximum possible OEE. But it also creates an opportunity that for an um, uh, like a OEM, for example, you can have an additional revenue stream. So you can spec in this machine surveillance and you can uh, enable 24-7 support for your customer, for example. Mm -hmm. So they feel very, uh, very safe in terms of uh, breakdown of the machine. Mm -hmm. Also for SIs and so on, there's uh, many ways to uh, utilize machine surveillance. And I think also you know already uh, maybe uh, many other opportunities how to use it and utilize it. So I would also um, I'd like to get in contact with me, uh, with me or also with uh, your other Mitsubishi representatives that you already know. And I'm happy to discuss about this topic as well later yeah. on. And uh, the audience will see your email address in uh, shortly. So um, uh, I think that if there are some specific use cases, it will be possible to discuss. But actually, my next question will be something about how, how to avoid errors happening in the first place. Because machine surveillance with all these uh, features allows you to identify once something happened. But maybe going back to Oliver and uh, his toys like robots and servo systems. So what you can do about those components to avoid them from, from breaking or avoid, avoiding any type of errors on the production side? That will be my next question. So, so what we know and what we learned is that the unexpected downtime is a big issue in production. And often this unexpected downtime happened due to the yeah, break of mechanical parts. And there again, the AI, which is integrated in our robot service system, can help to make a predictive maintenance of the, yeah, of the parts, of the mechanical parts. So the, the algorithm, the AI algorithm, are looking to the real operation of the uh, parts, of the motors, of the, the, how the bearings are handled, how, and all the mechanical parts. So this is something which is not only comparing, I would say, fixed data, like comparing working hours. So like every 20,000 hours you need to make a maintenance. No, so with the AI, with the predictive maintenance function, it's really analyzing the, yeah, the load of the axis and so on. So finally, then the robot, the service system, are making decisions based on real time and also on past trends. What I explained, the main mechanical parts in a robot are the, the bearings, the gears and the belts. And these are always controlled because the system knows what the robot is doing for sure. It knows what has been done in the past. It knows the structure of these mechanical parts. And it can warn of a failure, of a wearing, of a breakdown in a really early stage already. So that means the downtime can be reduced. And the important point is the schedule can be, uh, sorry, the maintenance can be scheduled in advance. So. It's a planned maintenance and not the sudden maintenance 
what we said, what we learned, it will be the big issue in the production. But additionally, we are also already in an early stage, which means the de design phase of the machine able to simulate such kind of uh, maintenance capabilities. We are, can use our software tools, run the real, uh, I would say, application in a simulation. And already there, we get the information when the parts need to have maintenance. So the maintenance, like the annual maintenance, can already be be planned before the machine is working. And for sure, then you can already cover the cost. Or probably you optimize your movements and then get down the maintenance um, uh, intervals. About the servo motion, we have learned that the auto tuning helps also for the reduction, uh, or the, sorry, uh, for the maintenance intervals. But also our servo system, servo motion system, have an AI-based based predictive maintenance integrated. So if you have any external components, mechanical components are like ball screws, a belt or gear connected to our servo motors, the system can detect any wearing of the belt or increase the backlash of a gear or even if the ball screw needs uh, additional grease because it's getting more dry, fric friction will in uh, increase. So it helps you also to schedule maintenance, to give a warning before the products will fail because this is a big topic. And so what we are can say, with our, especially with our latest generation of uh, servo system, we can make the predictive maintenance somehow in any kind of machine. And this is without any additional cost because these predictive maintenance functions are integrated in the amplifier as a standard functions. And for, for sure, it will improve the machine, it will improve the efficiency of the machine, and it will improve the unexpected downtimes with mm -hmm. yeah, told like an big issue in the production. So again, uh, we were showing a video uh, with uh, this uh, type of yes. solution that you uh, uh, described. And I think what is uh, very important to stress is that the belts and the gears and so on, those are not integral parts of the servo. Those are no. external parts that are you know, crucial for the machine performance. But the point is that they are out of the servo system, right? Again, the servo is advanced enough to be yeah. able to recognize these problems even with the outside world, let's say. Yeah. So it's very advanced. So, so any of these, I would say, typical mechanical parts like ball screw gears and belts, which are often connected to our motors, can be yeah, monitored, can be checked and can be analyzed. So mm -hmm. this is not for a typical part. And I think that's the big advantage and can be used for any kind of machines. Okay. So thanks for this, and uh, maybe I will have one more question to John because, um, well, we, we discussed this already that uh, TSN is clearly um, a game-changing technology in many regards. So how would you um, describe the benefits of the time-sensitive networking for maintenance reasons? So um, again, just to have this kind of practical view on this specific function in the factory. Right. <clears throat> well, um, I, I guess um, if you look at a typical factory, obviously there's there's many machines distributed over different production lines and so on. So one of the key uh, one of the key areas is being able to collect all the data together and ba basically make sense of it all in one go. And, and again, that's where TSN provides benefits. You know, you, you could imagine that in, in some respects, TSN is kind of like the glue. That holds that holds the whole thing together and allows the data to flow um, to where it's needed and, and people can act on it and and get the right information to to take the action that's needed. You know, I, I guess another way to think about it is TSN is kind of like the plumbing of the factory. It's letting the data flow from one place to another, so that maintenance technicians can see what's going on. They can decide when to act and what to do and so on. So uh, yeah, it, it's a very key part of of holding everything together in, in the factory. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and uh, from a maintenance point of view, I think that, uh, for example, having a timestamp that is well integrated in the, the, the network protocol itself helps a lot because then you don't have to, uh, again, coming back to the synchronization of information, don't have to go back to the uh, well database or whatever, wherever you store your data to uh, assign a timestamp. This is integrated in the network. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that's it, uh, what we wanted to say today, and uh, maybe two words of conclusion, um, because we wanted to give you an outlook of how the future factories might uh, look like. So we are talking here about um, technologies that are uh, going to only gain traction in the next couple of years. This is going to um, uh, reshape what happens in the factories. So uh, all this data has to be managed properly. Then it's not only about having the data, collecting it, but also taking decisions based on the information that uh, you understood. Um, but I think that the key message that uh, we want to give you uh, and uh, mention game field of the future, um, we believe that we are not talking here about building this future of um, building this future of uh, factories um, from scratch. It doesn't mean that this is a, going to be a greenfield uh, situation when you have to spend billions to create this kind of new factory. What we are talking here is something that you can start doing today with these small pieces, small puzzles that we uh, just described. And you are essentially modifying your factory one step at a time. So you can imagine your production site equipped with some old robot arms or not having any robots at all. But then you are adding this kind of smart features, artificial intelligence driven features on the component level, and your factory is becoming modernized by this. So that's why I think that the main message, and this is something that we always try to underline uh, in our conversations, is that you can start small whenever you are ready on the level that you are comfortable with and scale up and change the factory one step at a time. And this is going uh, to be our main message. I hope uh, you enjoyed our conversation. I really thank my guests, uh, four of them. Uh, Luckily, the weather, terrible weather, didn't uh, change our moods about this event. Um, and essentially, this is the message we wanted to give you. Uh, we have a second uh, for some Q&A uh, questions that we, we could answer. I haven't seen that many, uh, even though the, the turnout was very uh, big. Uh, unless everything is, you know, perfectly clear, you are, you still have a chance to ask one or two questions. But I have one, and this is related to robots. Uh, but maybe this can be also generalized. But um, generally, we are. Uh, there is a question asking how you can make sure that the uh, robots uh, provide like a high availability. I guess the, this is point about availability in the context of the overall uh, equipment efficiency uh, so that uh, you sustain the production process without the errors. And uh, I think that uh, the answer was given by you, Oliver, just a couple of minutes before. Uh, but generally speaking, we are talking here about being able to predict any issues with robot arms that might appear. And instead of waiting till the robot breaks, Yes. Acting in advanced, right? That's a point. That the mechanical parts which are in the robot, which are generating, yeah, I would say the fail or the stop of the robot, they are yeah, monitored, checked, and in advance it will recognize that it probably have an issue at an early stage already. So before it breaks, it gives you, oh, maybe something is going wrong with the gear. So please do a maintenance, maybe check the gear, but it's still working, but it gives you already a hint that the product, uh, sorry, the part will break because some changes happened inside the, the, I would say, vibration and so on. And this could be recognized due to this AI technology, which we are having integrated in our robot mm -hmm. system. Yeah, so um, I, I think that's the, the answer. 
Um, so, of, of course, um, a robot arm is a special type of a machine, but of course you can define an OE KPI for it. And uh, the best way to increase the time when the robot is available is basically making sure that uh, the error doesn't surprise you. I think that's the, the, the main message. Uh, in the meantime, there is another question, and uh, I wonder who could answer it best, but I guess it's again you, Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> so this time we are talking a lot about, uh, let's say, mechanics of, of the factory. So how about machine failures caused by faulty parts? And those faulty parts, uh, obviously, uh, that's the statement, will have different uh, lifespans, right? So one uh, gear will have this lifespan, the other will have another. Um, so I guess the question is that it's not that easy to schedule um, maintenance for mechanical parts uh, because you have to store some sort of information about those uh, parts. But again, and I don't want to repeat myself, but it seems that the predictive maintenance is again the answer to that uh, because that's something, well, where the servo system will do the job for the maintenance team, right? So the servo system is also like learning, I would say, the mechanical part. So that is the same like like I explained with the robot. Also the servo system is not like a human, but it's learning. So it's learning what is the optimal movement of the mechanical part. And if something is changing, that could be an example with the uh, missing uh, grease, so the friction will increase, then the motor system will recognize something changed in the, in the data which the motor, the amplifier, is seeing from the mechanics. And with this information, it can give you a warning, something is changing or a change in the mechanical parts before it probably will break. So it's again the I would say a little bit the, the machine learning process, which is also helping you to, um, yeah, to prevent the, uh, the mechanical breakdowns and to give in advance the information that uh, you should do maintenance, you should do something. And this is more or less, I would say, also uh, independent from the, the lifespan because we are not looking to the working hours. Yeah. We are looking to the real movement of the uh, mechanical parts. I mean, analyzing the amount of working hours is relatively easy, right? That's Here we are talking easy. about something else, clearly. Yeah. And uh, I think that maybe adding one more comment, I think that what matters uh, and what is crucial is that, well, first, you, first of all, you have this good state, right? Yes. When the machine yes. is performing well, this is when the, uh, let's say, servo system is learning the good operation. Yes. And then this this can be compared with well, with time, yeah. yeah. Like if things are changing in time, I think yeah. that's that's the essence of how this yes. works. Um, we are talking, and uh, the, there are more and more questions <laughs> coming. <laughs> so we will stay a couple of minutes more. Um, the next question is about the AI. Uh, can we use AI to uh, make some service time when parts, for example? Uh, different parts uh, should be checked. So again, getting some hints from the machine learning system that it's time for maintenance. Um, yes, I think that is uh, essentially what we just discussed. Um, however, I think uh, looking at a bit more general approach, um, so the AI can be used in many different scenarios. So you don't have to only, um, let's say, rely on the servo system brain or the robot brain. You can use the MyLab technology yeah. to analyze a specific set of data. And that data can be used for predicting failures, right? Exactly. So, so in a more general sense than just Oliver explained before for robots and servo drives, we could use the AI software to actually start bringing a data set together from the process and learning, just as you explained, the good state of the machine. When it's perfectly maintained and maintenanced, we would learn that as a model. And then by putting that model in an online diagnostic cycle, we would read in the production data continuously. And if something 
else will be abnormal of that data. My lab, for example, would inform us and we could use that signal as a pre-information to operators that something has now changed over time and we would recommend a maintenance. That would, of course, depend a lot on the specific application and the process, how we define that time for the pre-information. So could we use MyLab specifically to predict the real lifetime of a part? No, well, we, we would have to have a machine to do that. So yeah, there, sure. there's no simulation mode for that. Like, no, no, we like are talking Oliver about the real, real situation. Yes, yeah. but that would be possible, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's, that's the case. And I, I think that the message is that um, the AI is available on different levels. So on the component level, machine level, line, the whole line can be also analyzed. And there are just different uh, approaches, so different ways how you do it. Um, Okay, I think that we are nearly at the end. Uh, there is not a question, just a comment that TSN is a marvelous backbone for the future of factories and the next generation of machines. So I think that uh, at least some people from our audience agree <laughs> with, with that, the fact that TSN is game changer. Perfect, I think that we are done. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully you will visit me again. For sure. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.